Alan Hirsch Advisors, creating aha moments, presents Aha Business Podcasts. We provide opportunities to discover information to help you run your business and guide your decision making. The more you know, the better decisions you make. For more information, log on to alanhirschadvisors.com. I'm your host, Alan Hirsch. Attention business owners, has your business suffered financially from COVID-19? If so, let us help. I am Alan Hirsch, a member of Business Coaches Assembled under a grant from the Small Business Breakthrough Executive Team. Our mission is to help business owners who have seen their revenues negatively impacted by 20% or more due to the virus. We can help you recover 50,000 to 70,000 or more of your lost revenue over the next 90 to 120 days. For more information, go to www.ahaonlinelearning.com to receive my book, 45 Minute Breakthroughs. That's go to www.ahaonlinelearning.com. Welcome to today's podcast. My guest today is Bert Sadler uh, from Boxwood Strategies. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Alan. Good to see you. It's been a while. Good to see you again as well. So what motivates you to get up in the morning and go to work? Alan, somehow I knew you'd ask me that question. (laughs) I'm sure. And I'd say it goes back a few years. There was a time when I was a revenue producer. I'd get these calls out of nowhere. And it was from members of the recruiting community. And it, it never really felt good. And as I experienced that, it sort of stuck in my head. And I said, I, I, I just believe there's another way and there's a better way. As time went on, you know, we all go through career advanced and growth. I had the opportunity to become part of the recruiting community and I got to see it firsthand. And I did think there were some things that the recruiting community did that I still didn't think made sense. And as that advanced, I got to run my own business. And now I get up every day looking forward to trying to bring something different to what I think is a broken sector and making a difference in my own small way, trying to support small businesses and talented professionals in a business conversation, not an interview broken style. That gives me joy and pleasure and a reason to get up every day. So what what makes you think, of, Let's we can start from the beginning, but Really, one of the things is, so what do you think makes it broken that you're trying to fix, but what does, what does Boxwood Strategies do? Sure. What I think makes it broken is the very beginning, this notion that you want to get paid for a transaction. And Alan, I'm a business guy like you are. I think transactions are wonderful. We conduct transactions in business all the time. But the transaction itself doesn't really have an emotion. The transaction is a thing that happens, a service or a product, and it occurs. That's not the way hiring works. If you're being hired, you are dealing with the emotion of a human being It's not a commodity. And most recruiting models are based upon a fee that says, for for starters, don't worry about paying me until you've hired my candidate. First of all, I don't think anyone owns a candidate. And second of all, it's really about putting a resume down an employer's throat to make a commission. I, I just think that model itself is where a broken process starts. I think it should be a consultative approach. I don't think it should be casual as in pay me when you hire my candidate. I think it should be to the employer. You got to be serious. You got to make a commitment here. Hiring isn't an informal process. It is formal. And if you get it right, it makes a big difference. If you don't, it's painful. So to answer two parts of that question, I think it's broken because I think the transaction approach is the wrong approach for talent for human beings. And I think there's too many efforts today of shortcuts that move away from a human interaction and move toward technology or robots or tools. Boxwood's approach is we have a proven process that gets deeply interactive with the candidate because it started with a consultative engagement, a fixed fee, a commitment from the employer and a commitment from me at the very beginning, positioning me to have a business conversation with talent, not the silly interview questions. 
Yeah, well, it makes sense. I mean, you're you're looking for you you know uh, uh, you're looking for different people to put in different positions. So you know what's you know so what really is the strategies versus a headhunter? You're not really going out as a headhunter, no, because you're not just filling vacancies to fill vacancies to yep. earn a commission, right? You're servicing the business to get uh, uh, candidates. So where does this, how'd you come upon this different <laughs> philosophy? So some of it is, is the experience I had at the receiving end, being a revenue producer and being a member of the business world and working for a Fortune 100 and getting approached and then finding I got ghosted uh, finding there wasn't anything real and saying again to myself, there, there's got to be another way. If we go back to a word you just used, headhunter, I, I, I struggle with why anybody would want to put a flag above their head and say, okay, world, I'm a headhunter. I, I wouldn't want <laughs> to give birth to children and be thrilled if they grew up to be headhunters. I just, I find that whole term to be odd and juxtaposed to good business practices, but it's really not that, it's what it means. Again, it means that as if I'm a headhunter, I'm going to take a resume and ram it down an employer's throat in order for me to make a commission, very simply. And the more the, the candidate gets paid, the more I get paid. Now I'm incented to find the most expensive talent because I make the most. But this transitions into another, another sector where a lot of companies hire multiple headhunters in order to get a position filled. Now those individuals are competing against each other. That's fine. But more importantly, they're competing against the employer. And I don't follow what sense it makes to be paid by an organization who you are competing against because they're looking for talent on their own. And now you end up with a very awkward feeling of where's the trust? Where's everybody working in the same direction? Where's the alignment? It, it, it just doesn't exist. Um, so I, I, I'm at juxtaposed positions with that piece. Part of what, where I developed this or came from it is getting to see it from somewhat of a distance, getting to see it firsthand. And then saying, I think there's another way to do this and running that and having it work and having it work repeatedly for a number of years. Yeah. So how do you uh, get your clients and what do you do differently now that you get a fee up front for, for servicing that client? Sure. The, the, the source of clients these days is coming, I'm very happy to say, from a lot of referrals and a lot of work that I've done. And I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in a little more detail in a moment. So because I've entered into a very different approach and because the business owner or the CEO and I have reached a business agreement that is based on a fixed fee, flat fee, I'm able to say to a candidate in an early part of the conversation, most respect intended, I don't need you, the candidate, in order for me to be successful. And that usually puts people off for a second. And then I say, wait a minute, that was meant respectfully because I don't need to ram your resume down this employer's throat for me to be successful. I'm getting paid. We have an agreement. I'm going to have a business conversation with you and we're going to have a conversation that's authentic and discusses the challenge that this employer is trying to solve and discusses your abilities to do that and provide you the candidate with a significant amount of transparent information. So together we can figure out if this makes sense. Beyond that, I say to the candidate, I'm not here to feed you to the lions. The worst thing you could have happen to you is go take a job that you can't do, don't wanna do, and it's gonna keep you awake at night. That, mm -hmm. That's a terrible mistake. And most candidates look at me and go, I've never heard that before, keep talking. And now we have again, much more of a different discussion and an authentic discussion for the purpose of that talent being able to come in after they've gone through the boxwood process and they've created a plan of action and worked with in the interview, if you want to call it that process, worked with the hiring manager, they're ready to begin their new job on day one with a path of success. To me, that's what the whole boxwood process is about. So when working with a candidate or mm -hmm. actually working with a business, yes. 
how much time do you spend with the business in order to make sure you understand what it is that they're looking for? Do you a look lot. at their culture? Do you look at their uh, work environment? Uh, yep. Those kinds of things. It, it, that's a great question. And you kind of analyze that too. It, it, if you had a pain and you went to your doctor and you said, this pain hurts, and you, and, and you started to tell the whole story of what happened and how the pain evolved, et cetera, et cetera. And the doctor kept interrupting you because the doctor only needs about three or four pieces of data to understand where he needs to focus. I, I'm not giant trying to compare myself to a doctor. I'm comparing myself to someone who's able to ask the key questions in order to get the key pieces of data. And that's essentially where the conversation goes. What, what I'm looking for is, and most of my clients are, quote, small businesses, privately held, not public traded companies. What I'm looking for is to develop a relationship with the business owner and for the business owner to tell me, what's the problem? Why would you want to hire someone? What's the problem that they need to solve? Alan, this is a place, in my opinion, where hiring is very broken because that question is not asked enough. And if a hiring manager cannot easily answer, here's the problem I need this talented person to solve if I hire them, they're not ready to make a hire. So I work with that business owner, that hiring manager, in trying to understand that. I also want to understand what comp range we'd be talking about. So at least we're in a competitive situation. What are the things that you want this new hire to do in their first six months that can be measured? You get the first six months right, you're on a good path for the remaining period that they're gonna be part of your company to be successful. But you've gotta be thinking about what that first six month period is about. What are the specific requirements? What's the background? Now, these questions I ask partly because I need to know if the hiring manager has those thoughts together. I also need to know if we can be successful. And if you're looking for the only one or two people in the world that can do it, it's gonna be a difficult day in order to find that talent. Uh, so those conversations go into the process. I'm also at the same time trying to determine if this is somebody who wants to work with me and is somebody who I wanna work with. What's important when you're working with a candidate uh, that can help them find a better way to attract themselves to the business. So, so as, as you've asked me a couple times, sort of what's different, and I hear your question along those lines, my approach to this solving today's broken hiring process, let's go back for a moment and talk about interviewing and asking questions and, and candidates navigating their way through a hiring event. In so many cases, there's this desire to blast candidates with questions. And in some cases, God help us, trick candidates. I don't get that. But if you go to the internet, you'll see a lot of interview questions. And right next to them, you'll see a lot of interview answers. Wow. Using that approach, I think, gets us nowhere. I would much, much more recommend, and I implement, the belief that we will learn more. My client and I will learn so much more by the questions a candidate asks us than we will ever learn by the questions we ask a candidate. Originality, curiosity, the ability to transition information, you can't fake that. And by having a candidate ask questions, then it's an ability to measure what did the candidate do with the right. information that was provided. And in this process, and I deeply agree with you, measuring success is critically important. Every hiring manager in the world wants to be reconfirmed that they made a good choice. Right. And trying to come up with some way to measure that in the first 15 or 30 days and the first six months is critical for the candidate, the new hire to be given confidence and support from their new employer and the new employer, the hiring manager to be given the confidence, I made a good choice. So if we take the process and have several interactions with the hiring jury, the hiring manager and other members of the organization and information is openly provided, you get to measure how a candidate manages that information and turns that into the candidate saying, well, here's what I think the focus should be in the first six months. And those items don't have to be 
sales revenue in any specific job role, there should be tasks and goals that are measured and can be accomplished. And now you've got the ability to measure that success in a fairly short amount of time, as well as over a longer period of six months. Yeah. So when, let's, let's take a break now. And when we come back, I'll continue this conversation uh, with Berth Sadler of Boxwood Strategies. I'm Alan Hirsch of Alan Hirsch Advisors, and this is AHA Business Podcast. Hi, Rick Dempsey here. As a former Oriole and Series MVP, I know a lot about winning and championship teams. Today, I'm happy to tell you about my award-winning web design and internet marketing team, Adventure Web Interactive. For over two decades, many of Maryland's most successful firms have chosen Adventure Web as their strategic partner for web design and online marketing. I can tell you from using them personally, their search engine optimization and social media programs have saved their clients tens of thousands over the traditional pay-per-click digital agency. Visit AdventureWebInteractive.com and listen to what clients such as Hercules Fence, TriStar Electric, ABC Rental, Rhine Landscaping, Markdown's Office Furniture, and many more highly successful firms have to say. And don't forget to tell them Rick Dempsey sent you. Strengthen, protect, and preserve your retirement nest egg. Scott Garceau here for the Stephen J. Sless Group, Baltimore's reverse mortgage specialist. Reverse mortgages have evolved to become a viable retirement tool. Enjoy retirement without monthly mortgage payments, improve cash flow, pay off debt, and stretch retirement savings. Stephen and his team can offer strategies to make housing wealth work for you. If you're 62 or older, learn if a reverse mortgage could help. Visit ReverseBaltimore.com. An equal housing opportunity lender. This is not a commitment to last. Stephen J. Sless, NMLS 298581. BRMI, NMLS 3094. Here we go. Uh, welcome back to the show. My guest uh, for this uh, podcast is Bert Sadler uh, from Boxwood Strategies. Uh, when we left off, we, we were talking about the success or failure of a candidate in interviewing. I want to take another step because we've been dealing for the last nine months. Well, actually, it's 11 months now. Uh, so how's hiring itself during the pandemic? As I mentioned earlier, I, I've been doing this a while. I deeply believe in the human interaction. And if you had handed me a suitcase full of cash before the pandemic and said, Bert, I, I want you to go conduct what you do, but you'll never be able to meet with anyone in person, I'd have handed you back the money and said, Alan, nice idea, never going to work. So reality hit for all of us. Uh, I made an investment in a little better camera. Whatever I can do to make my face <laughs> for radio look better, I should try to do it. Well, yeah, I, I know the feeling. I have a face for radio. And, uh, and now we're, we're doing this live on, there we go. Uh, on uh, Zoom, yes. But I, I, my experience has been very good. Uh, I look back now about 12 months of this pandemic. And in the last 12 months, I haven't met any candidates. I haven't met any new clients in person. And we've been able to get along pretty well on this less than perfect video platform. And to some degree, I think there are some advantages. Uh, I've had you know, 12 Zooms in a day. I could never have done that with airplanes and meetings and meeting with people, couldn't do it. And I, I think there is some efficiency. I also think there is an, a, the need to adjust the paradigm and look at where the change is headed, which is the basis of all business. You can't continue to run on exactly yesterday's platform. What absolutely. are the adjustments you have to make and got to go do it? Yeah, absolutely. We've all had to change the processes we're doing. I mean, I now have a client in Utah. I have one, I think, in South Africa that I'll know next next week. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's just expanding beyond what, what you can imagine. Uh, and I never leave my my uh, my office. Uh, it's all done through Zoom, yep. um, and I think it's great. I think it's changed a lot of what people uh, are doing. So, how has the pandemic changed the way companies are attracting talent and processing the the recruitment process? I mean, well, obviously, I, I, it's I think not personal anymore. No, that. There's a couple aspects to this. I think it's pandemic related. It is also the times related. That there is, in my observation, a sector of the hiring world that would like to cut as many corners as possible, that would like to shortcut 
as much as possible. And I see this trend occurring more with the larger organizations. The pandemic may or may not be fueling it. I've, I referred earlier to my belief in good recruiting. It's an interpersonal human interaction. It's not a transaction. And one of the trends I'm seeing is candidates being interviewed by robots. This notion of artificial intelligence, um, being able to take the information and do something with it. And Ellen, you and I have been in the workforce for more than a few days. I, I gotta tell you, if I were to be interviewed and the first thing that that employer did was put me through a robot, I would be off that and out of there so quickly because the message it would be saying to me is, we don't care about people. You are insignificant. Therefore, we're gonna have a robot talk to you, not a human being. Um, and again, maybe this can be defended by the pandemic. I, don't, I think it is more a defense of, we just wanna do this more quickly. How do we go faster? The tools out there are wonderful, but there should be nothing that replaces human interaction. Um, with respect to the, the bigger question, I think this is a period in time where companies who have folks who have some confidence and some independence and the ability to provide leadership without touching their employees every day are worth more. And companies who have employees who really do a lot of micromanaging and have to see and touch or having employees who need to be micromanaged are now gonna be in trouble because with this pandemic, we've recognized we can work from home, we can work remotely and we don't need our hand held every five minutes. If you are that kind of worker and, and employee and leader, you just moved up the scale. If you aren't, you didn't. Well, so many businesses, uh, uh, I know a law firm, a successful regional law firm here in Baltimore, where 40 to 60% of the attorneys say they're not coming back. They're yeah. gonna work from home. Right. So the, the retail space that, uh, that uh, or commercial space that they need has drastically changed. Uh, web designers, uh, one that actually sponsors this show, Web, web uh, Adventure Web, uh, says they're, the people working at home are more productive. They're not bringing them back. Uh, and it's, 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 it's changed the dynamic completely. It, and, and this is, you know, another one of these, it, it, it's not a slight shift. It is a major change organizations who were very viable businesses before this hit, now they aren't. Restaurants are having a tough time as you talked about it. Uh, commercial real estate, I don't think that's gonna be a fun sector anytime soon. No, if I don't you happen either. to be selling dogs right now, you're on fire. Right. There, there, there are certain parts of this economy that couldn't have been predicted, but that's an example of one. The and, cats and, and dogs, the number of pets being bought to keep people uh, company in their in their offices when they're home all the time has gone through the roof. As it, if you happen to have a business investment in Peloton, you are doing very, very well. Uh, and I think, again, this is just a reminder that this business world we're in requires adjustment, change, creativity, and clear focus. The business world hasn't gone away. It, it's just changed to some degree how we can do it. Now the question is, can you as an individual make those adjustments and be relevant mm -hmm. and deliver value where it is being required? Yeah, so are recruiting companies uh, having problems competing with the job boards? Uh, you know, like ZipRecruiter and uh, some of the others that are out there. Uh, you know, or even, uh, you know, the giant social networks like LinkedIn, are they creating problems for you as a, as a recruiter? Or is this actually enhancing your business? Well, I, I, I'd say depending upon who you are and what you do, maybe. Uh, again, I, I'm not gonna put Boxwood in the category of the headhunter and the transactional work. So for the most part, those are, if anything, tools that are available at my disposal to promote a particular role I'm working on or uh, seek talent. For the most part, if you are a member of today's business world, you exist on LinkedIn in some form or another. There, there's a few exceptions to that, but almost anyone and everyone who has a viable presence in the business world is on LinkedIn in some form or another. Um, in that regard, LinkedIn is an excellent tool to identify people, but 
you know, one of the one of the questions I get on a regular basis is, where do you find candidates? And my answer, for the most part, is that's really not the question, because the world has become so small with the internet. Finding candidates is easier. What do you do with it when you have found a good one? And what do you do with it when you have found someone who's never going to be a candidate? You only have a certain amount of time, and that, to me, is where the magic or the art or lack of you know, with recruiting comes into play. Let's call it execution. And it, if I may take another moment in answering your question, it's my opinion, my observation that those sites you mentioned, ZipRecruiter, LinkedIn, Indeed, they do a very nice job of having an internet connection or a web connection between information and, and candidates. They do not seem to have an expertise when it comes to the execution of a recruitment. Uh, and on my first-hand experience, I have never found anyone in those organizations that is able to truly execute a recruitment. And in that regard, I don't regard them as a competitor in any way, shape, or form. I execute recruitments. They have a job board, two different things. Okay. So how do small businesses effectively uh, compete against employers with household names? Uh, well, I, I kind of look at every recruiting need, every hiring need being unique. Every business out there from one person operations up to big giant organizations have their own unique culture. You kind of referred to that earlier and they have their own unique story. And I think the challenge for each of them is to be able to tell their story and talk about what it is they're trying to accomplish. And if you're able to do that, in a productive and straightforward way, the candidates will respond to it. And in some cases, you get people who really are not even close to being a fit and you've got to be able to filter them out. Small businesses don't have to serve shareholders like large publicly traded companies. Small businesses have the opportunity to be a little more creative and they have a different story to tell. In a small business, a top talent can come in and really move the needle by the work that that individual did. As terrific as, let's say, Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman or one of the big organizations out there, it's unlikely that any individual is going to come in and significantly move the needle for such a large organization. So the small ones should really be promoting that talent can come in and really make a difference. And there are members of the talent community that love that. And there are others that it does not really resonate to them. Therein lies attracting the right people for the organization who are the right fit. Okay. So the last couple of questions are, uh, you know, what advice would you give to an employer needing to hire talent? And what advice would you give to an active job seeker? I would say to both members of that community, there's a lot of really bad information out there. And I, I, I can offer an example or two, but it just goes on and on and on. First of all, as, a, as an employer, I think the most important piece is you've got to define what's the business problem that you need solved when hiring an individual. A lot of recruiting events start with who? Who do I want? Oh, I like this person. I know that person. They're friends of mine. Let me go talk to them and see if I can bring them in. And I, I, I think the reverse approach is the better one. What is it that you need someone to do? Define that first. And then it's about who might or might not fit that. As from a, from a candidate or a job seeker perspective, the recruiting community in general is not your friend. The recruiting community in general is serving the employer, the headhunter gets paid by taking a resume and putting it down the throat of an employer and getting a commission. That, that makes the candidate, sorry, a piece of meat. And from a candidate perspective, a lot of job seekers think that the recruiting community exists to get them a job. I, I, I don't agree with that. I think the candidate has their own responsibility to find their own role. And the candidate should be focused on, do, does the candidate understand what the problem is that they would be hired to solve. If they don't understand that, if that hasn't been communicated, the candidate needs to spend time working through that, understanding that, 
in order to get to a conclusion, do I have the ability to solve that? And so many times I'm talking to candidates who receive some sort of coaching that made them say to me, come on, I can learn it. I can learn anything. Just, you know, just get, let me start here. Uh, again, I, I think that's a failed approach. I've never met anybody who can do anything. It's a matter of understanding what the role is and what the challenges are, and then talking through, again, in an open discussion to determine, do you have the skill set, and do you and the hiring manager have a fit? Um, so the, again, back to this transactional model that's very, very common. I, I think it is a failed approach. And I think the hiring manager really needs to take an active role in the hiring the people that they want to come in. And the candidates need to take an active role in trying to have a conversation with, quote, the department of yes. Who has the authority to hire you? Who are you going to work with? <laughs> Do you feel good about yeah. that? Do you like them? Do you want to? And can, and can you imagine yourself doing this? And then how can you communicate the value that you'd be bringing if that were the case? And I would also suggest that it becomes very helpful if you can be passionate about the work that you're going to be doing. <laughs> and, and, I, and, and that, I think, is sometimes overlooked. It, I couldn't agree with you more. Again, Alan, you, you and I enjoy a place in the business world where we are at a point where we enjoy what we do. That, you know, for a lot of folks just getting out of college and just starting their first job or their second job, you, they, they need a paycheck badly in order to cover their expenses and get through to tomorrow. As, as you get into a little bit more of an ideal situation or a little bit more of a favorable situation, I think we're all a lot more effective in our work if we are doing something that we do have some passion about, do have some joy with, you know, that to me is the ideal place to be whenever possible, but right. not always I, possible. I, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much, Bert, for being a guest on the podcast. I appreciate it. How can our listeners reach you? Best way to reach me is one of two ways. Um, Boxwood's website is www.boxwoodsearch.com. I can be reached at Bert Sadler, B-E-R-T-S-A-D-T-L-E-R at boxwoodsearch.com. Uh, there is information there for job seekers and there's a little bit of information about Boxwood. Uh, that's probably the best way. Okay, well, th thank you very much for being on the uh, show today. I'm Alan Hirsch of Alan Hirsch Advisors, your host. To reach me, visit my website, www.ahaonlinelearning.com and register to get my uh, book, 45 Minute Breakthroughs. You can listen to the podcast, the past shows, wherever you get your podcast by subscribing to AHA Business Podcast. You can also follow me on LinkedIn at Alan Hirsch. I'm Alan Hirsch, and this has been AHA Business Podcast.